Thank you. Good morning. May it please the court. Oh, hold on. All right. Let's proceed. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court. Leslie O'Brien for, for Sean Fitzpatrick. I'd like to begin by addressing Mr. Fitzpatrick's double jeopardy argument and the closely related argument that the evidence in the second trial was not sufficient to survive a, a directed verdict. Um, I begin by saying, as the court knows, it was not only the, the first jury that reported itself hung in this case, but the second jury also, after nearly four days of deliberations, reported itself hung, although it eventually did arrive at, at a verdict. I, I say that um, to, to shed light on the, the nature of the evidence and also to counter what the Commonwealth says is a, a plethora of evidence supporting the, the guilty verdicts in this case. Because the case was entirely circumstantial, both sides have, have focused on whether there was sufficient evidence of motive, means, opportunity, and in addition, uh, consciousness of guilt. I'd suggest that the, the evidence in this case was particularly weak as to means and opportunity but even as to motive, which was stressed by the Commonwealth, there were, there were grave weaknesses. Well, you don't dispute that uh, the defendant and the wife of uh, the victim, Z Zanetti, had been having an affair, do you? I don't, Your Honor. There was certainly evidence of that. And in ad addition, there was evidence that Mr. Fitzpatrick wished that that relationship would continue. However, even after the supposed breakup that was said to have occurred, I believe it was three weeks before the, the shooting in this case, even after that point, the, the relationship was ongoing, and it was ongoing much as before. There was evidence that uh, Mrs. Zimitti, Michelle Zimitti, had made 30 calls to the defendant uh, between the time of the supposed breakup and the, uh, uh, and the shootings. So there was certainly not this, uh, this evidence of, of desperation on Mr. Fitzpatrick's part that the, that the Commonwealth sought to portray. I'd suggest that uh, one of the stronger, what, what appeared to be one of the stronger pieces of evidence that the Commonwealth was able to present was Michelle Zamitti's statement that she had told the defendant at the time of the breakup, uh, I'm not going to, we're not going to be able to be together unless something happens to, to my husband. Well, in the, in the first trial, there was actually a, a, a stipulation between the parties that Michelle Zamitti had never mentioned such a statement until she was being prepared for trial, until approximately four weeks before the first trial began. So certainly that evidence did not have the, the strength that it might at first blush appear to have had. Uh, so that, so that the mode of evidence I'm suggesting was, was not nearly as strong as it was represented to be. Excuse the, me, but in, in this test, aren't we supposed to look at the evidence in the light most favorable to the Commonwealth? Yes, I, I, I certainly, as so, I must so recognize that. Weighing the strength and, and uh, I, I don't really understand how that plays into the test. Well, it, it plays in because, of course, the, the, the Lattimore uh, standard is that some record evidence is, is not sufficient. It must be evidence that has enough weight for a, a rational jury to find guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. So there is an element of weighing the, um, the, the strength of, of the evidence, I'd suggest, Your Honor. Um, in terms of the, the evidence of, of means, the means in this case was a 16-gauge shotgun, and the, the Commonwealth struggled mightily to, to draw a connection between the defendant and a, a shotgun that was seen at some point in the Zimitti uh, vacation home in Freedom, New Hampshire. There was testimony from Michelle Zimitti that the defendant was present when some children discovered this shotgun and some other guns in that home. Uh, she said that the, the defendant was, was present. 
Her friend, who was, who was also said to be there, Suzanne Gaudet, initially told police that the defendant was, was not there. But by the time of the first trial, she had changed her testimony and said that the, the defendant was, was there. So again, I'm, I'm uh, speaking of the, the weakness of what the, the Commonwealth considered to be some of its stronger points. The, the theory as to how the defendant came into pos possession of the means, the 16-gauge shotgun, was that he broke into the, the vacation home of the Zemitis, and not only that, but broke into two other vacation homes in order to mask that action. Now, all of those break-ins were investigated by the police. There, were, there was fingerprinting done. There was, there was DNA analysis done. The defendant's home was... When were the um, break-ins discovered? They were discovered with... I know it was within two weeks of It was the, after the, the murder, though? Yes. Yes, they were discovered after the murder. So they were, and the, uh, the break-ins were investigated. Uh, the, no, they were into uh, the summer homes of people who lived in this uh, small neighborhood that yes. the defendant lived year-round in, yes, correct? Yes, they were, and they were, they were in that neighborhood, but there was, at least in the second trial, there was testimony from a chief of police that there was a total of, of 17 break-ins into various summer homes. So it wasn't such a terribly unusual thing. But um, the, the, the point, my point, of course, is that the defendant was never connected in any way to those break-ins. And in addition, there was a, a fingerprint on a, um, on a checkbook that was found that was never connected to, to anyone. There was a, this mysterious uh, fingerprint on a checkbook that was out of, out of place in one of the break-ins. So the, uh, again, the evidence of, of means was, was weak. To establish opportunity, the, the Commonwealth relied um, in great part on some weak DNA evidence that they said placed the defendant in a truck that was theoretically used um, in the... You, you uh, refer to it as weak. Yes, um, I do. Well, it's, whatever it was, it speaks for itself. It was a, a coat hanger, wasn't it? Well, there was the, there was the, the coat hanger which was the, the testimony was that the evidence was inconclusive as to, to Mr. Fitz, Fitzpatrick. Um, so there, there is a separate issue as to that. But there was also offered testimony that his, um, that his profile was identified on the, on the steering wheel of this, this green truck. And the keys? And a, and a set of keys, uh, a mixed profile, a much, uh, a much lesser amount or a much uh, not, not the... Wasn't the major profile on the keys he contributed to the DNA they found, right? It was said to be the principal profile on the, on the steering wheel. Oh, right. But there was also testimony that that, that, that was a particularly tiny amount of, of DNA 0.288 nanograms, far less than the optimal minimum amount, but also that it was degraded, and there was never any explanation given as to why that, when the truck was taken and towed to Massachusetts for processing approximately two weeks later, why there should be this degraded DNA sample. And there was testimony given uh, by the, the prosecution's witness, Mr. Fred Martin, the owner of the, the truck, that he and Mr. Fitzpatrick, that the summer previously had handled the same boat cover or, or a tarpaulin on, on the boat. So there was a, an But, but didn't Mr. Martin also testify that the defendant had never been uh, behind the wheel of, the car, uh, of, of that truck? He did. There was conflicting evidence of that. The, the defendant said he was behind, behind the wheel, but uh, Mr. Martin did acknowledge that he and the defendant had handled the same uh, boat cover or, or tarpaulin uh, at but a time. Not, but, that, but that's not where the DNA was. The, the tarpaulin... The DNA was inside the truck yes. on the steering wheel. Yes, and, the tarpaulin was... So the Commonwealth had evidence from Mr. Martin that the defendant had never previously been inside the truck cab, right? Well, what, what I'm yes, and what I'm suggesting is that there was an innocent explanation offered for that in that both Mr. Martin, the owner of the truck, and the defendant had handled the same, the so same it's, tarpaulin. It's a transferred DNA theory? 
Yes, exactly. That was the that was the theory that was that was one theory that was offered for for how the DNA appeared inside inside the trucks. Of course, the defendant himself testified that he had helped to move the that he had used the truck at one point to uh, to help Mr. Martin move his his boat. Uh, so that it suggests that um, the just in conclusion that the that the evidence of of, oppor of motive opportunity and uh, motive means and opportunity was not of the strength that the uh, that the Commonwealth has represented it to be. Now, how does I, how does the the toll sequence relate to this? Is that sort of separate from your analysis of opportunity? Well, the fact that the truck was tracked coming down from Freedom. At least it, in Massachusetts. Well, it's yes, it is. It's certainly part of uh, that. The, that this truck was traced as far south as as the Hampton tolls. Right. That's certainly something that that factors in. And then the video but, of a very similar truck. They couldn't make a, a precise comparison, but a very similar truck in the parking lot or in the area of the killings that morning. Yes. Yeah, so there's that that additional. Evidence, but still nothing directly placing the, the defendant in Wakefield. But, but, but uh, don't you have to deal with the problem? I mean, even if the, the, the individual components of the evidence that you're describing have weaknesses to them, uh, the, the, the fact of the matter is the sum is, is greater than the, uh, or the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Uh, it, together, they, they, uh, they, they paint a, a somewhat damning picture of the defendant, don't they? Well, I, I'm I'm not disputing that there were many parts that were that were there were all these various parts of a circumstantial case that were that were offered. Uh, I'm pointing out the, the the weaknesses in in those parts. And yeah, I, I mean, and you've done a good job at that. But but when you start putting these pieces together, these faint pieces together. Yes, there, there's they, a somewhat clear picture that emerges. Well, I, I'd suggest that it's a it's a picture that that could also be seen as an illusion, and that that's the reason that the that two juries had so much difficulty with it. That there were these bits and pieces, but all of these weak bits and pieces, including no evidence putting the defendant in in Wakefield at all, um, were were unconvincing and and don't meet the standard. What I, um, what evidence was there as to the time of death? The time. Uh, we know when the bodies were discovered. Yes. But what do we know about the time of death? Was there any testimony to that effect? I believe it was. Uh, um, it's not something I have fresh in mind, but I. But if I recall correctly, it was calculated by the the time on some films that showed um, Chester Roberts walking to the. The, the point in time when he walked to the uh, to the to the firm that was owned by the Zamitis, I'm, I'm actually a little bit unclear okay. on exactly how that was that was established. So there was some testimony establishing when he was last seen alive. Yes, there was. So that gave and a window, in other words. It did, and there, there's more than that. I'm afraid I'm. I'm Okay, blanking on it a little bit, but it, the, somehow it, the the time of the time of the the shooting was established at approximately quarter of quarter of eight in the morning, seven forty eight, okay. I believe, something along those lines. Um, I also did want to, if I may, discuss the matter of the the admiss admissibility of the New, New Hampshire toll evidence. Um, this has been treated by the Commonwealth, by both the Commonwealth and by the the judge who allowed that evidence as a conflict of, of laws issue. And I'd suggest to the court there, there's no conflict of, of laws, and, th and that's not the correct analysis. The New Hampshire statute purports to, to relate only, to govern only the New Hampshire tolls, just as the Massachusetts statute uh, pr purports to govern only the Massachusetts tolls. So the correct uh, law in this case to be followed was New Hampshire law. The, uh, once you get past the, the argument that there was a conflict of, of laws, the question becomes really whether admitting those toll records could somehow be justified as, as a policy matter. And the Commonwealth 
uh, argues that the, that the policy in, in prosecuting a, a double homicide somehow outweighed whatever interest New Hampshire might have had in, in governing its, uh, the use of information gathered by, in, these, in these toll records. Now, Mr. Martin was the one who had, if anyone had a, a real interest in keeping these records um, private, and he's the one who came forward with this information, so he consented to the Commonwealth having this information, didn't he? He did consent, but the, uh, the statute applies not only to the holder of the transponder, it applies to occupants, it even applies to the vehicles themselves. When you look at the, at the statute, the statute is, is written so broadly that it becomes clear that what New Hampshire was restricting the use of that information to, New Hampshire re chose to restrict that information gathered by the electronic tolls to the collecting of money and nothing else. And it's written so broadly that I think that a fair inference can be drawn that New Hampshire had decided that these, this information would not be used as a sort of big brother surveillance uh, tool. They could have, New Hampshire certainly could have made exceptions to the rule. They, they could have made exceptions uh, stating that only the, only the owner of the vehicle was, was covered. They could have made exceptions for, for crimes. Instead, it's this very straightforward statute when you look at it. These records will not be used in court. Uh, no information about vehicles, about occupants, about the holder of the transponder. It's, uh, Do it's, you think that binds a Massachusetts court? Somehow uh, a New Hampshire law saying that information is not admissible binds a Massachusetts court? Where yes. Where the person who essentially owns the information has provided it in a double homicide? I'm, not, I'm really uh, well, to... Your Honor, I, I'm suggesting first that, that Fred Martin is not the is not the owner of the information. I take it he's the subscriber. He's a sub subscriber, but the but the statute is much broader. I, I, I'm just saying, and so Massachusetts needs to defer to New Hampshire law about whether something's admissible in a New Hampshire court. It, it, but it's it's more than yes. I'm suggesting that Massachusetts owes full full faith and credit to New Hampshire's laws about the use of information gathered in New Hampshire, in New oh, Hampshire tolls, and that there's no credit. Massachusetts policy that would, that would override that, does, that does, would override New Hampshire's interest. Does full faith and credit only apply to judgments, or does it apply to statutes? It applies to, it applies to, to statutes, to the laws of other, uh, to the laws of other jurisdictions. Which is why um, I'd suggest, Your Honor, we, we have these conflicts that occasionally come up where, where for example, one state allows, uh, allows one party to consent to recording of a telephone call. Another party might have a different statute and you, and you run into conflict of, of laws uh, problems there. Am I uh, forgetting something? Did, was this question raised with the New Hampshire Attorney General's office? It, it was, or, or at least the New Hampshire Attorney General's office gave uh, permission. Gave, I'm not sure if it can be termed as permission, but um, I, you know, I, I, I'd suggest that that can't be seen as. as I a mean, final did they word. did they interpret? Let me see. New Hampshire Assistant Attorney General made some determination as to the application of the law in this case. Am I wrong about that? I think there is something to that effect, Your Honor, but if you look at the law, it's it's. So you're saying we shouldn't respect the New Hampshire Attorney General's interpretation of New Hampshire law. We should independently interpret New Hampshire law and apply it in New Hampshire in these circumstances. Well, I don't know how much authority the the New Hampshire Attorney General would have to decide uh, what the what the Massachusetts court should do. I'm just saying that the plain language of the statute says that that uh, information was not admissible. And would this and be subject to an abuse of discretion uh, standard on the basis um, that the judge allowed this in evidence? I don't believe it would be, Your Honor, because uh, any more than any rule of evidence could simply be a matter of the judge's discretion if the judge decided that the, that the case was very important, for example. Uh, but but in, even in New Hampshire, you can waive the rules of evidence, can't you? Mr. But the only person who waived here, Your Honor, no, I'm just saying, for purpose of admissibility in New Hampshire, <clears throat> this statute can be waived, can't it? 
theoretically, I mean, rules of evidence can be waived. By the person, if you look at the, the statute as creating a privilege, which I'd, I'd suggest it's hard to do that because you'd have to say that vehicles have a privilege because vehicles are covered by the statute. So the owner but of the vehicle uh, waived the privilege for the, the vehicle? But he couldn't waive it for the, for the occupant, and there's no way but that is, the is statute Is your client claiming occupants. he was an occupant? He's not claiming that so, he, so he was an occupant. So where's his standing? The, uh, well, what I'm actually suggesting is there's no, it's, the statute isn't creating a, a privilege. It's, apply, it's clearly not creating a privilege because it even applies to vehicles, which can't be holders of, of, of a privilege. Well, thank Mr. you, Your Honor. thank you. Good morning, Your Honors. My name is Loretta Lilios. I'm an Assistant District Attorney with Middlesex, and with me is Assistant District Attorney Jamie Charles, also with Middlesex. On the question of the toll records, the defendant here has no legally recognizable right in enforcing the New Hampshire toll statute because the only logical reading of that statute is that any rights of confidentiality or privilege belong to the authorized account holder or the authorized occupant of that vehicle. Here, the New Hampshire Attorney General, who was responsible for enforcing the laws of that state, made a determination that gave effect to Mr. Martin's waiver in this case. Mr. Martin wanted the authorities to have this information. He was the one who discovered it first. He alerted the authorities, and he signed a written waiver, which appears at page 93 of the supplemental record appendix. Mr. Martin also testified at trial, and it is apparent that his waiver was knowing and intelligent. All privileges, to the extent that this is a privilege, exist to advance some sort of public policy. Here, although there's no legislative history on the public policy, it seems reasonable to suggest that the policy would be to encourage citizens to sign up for this sort of system in order to increase the efficiency of the department in managing the toll roads, and that sort of policy would not be advanced by discounting the desires of the legitimate account holder and legitimate, legitimate um, owner of the vehicle who wants authorities to have uh, this information. But the statute's pretty broad. I mean, it's pretty encompassing. It does seem to suggest a, you know, a kind of New Hampshire uh, uh, don't tread on me kind of uh, philosophy, don't you think? I, I agree that the, st the New Hampshire statute uh, uh, explicitly speaks about vehicles, owners, occupants, and account holders. To the extent that there is any conflict of law uh, uh, analysis that is applicable here. I would suggest that the law of the forum, which is the Commonwealth prevails, and the Massachusetts statute that applies to toll records, which appears in the statutory addendum, uh, explicitly accounts for a waiver of the account holder and states that the account holder may waive uh, any such confidentiality interest that he has in these records. Uh, so uh, it's the Commonwealth suggestion here that any privilege that may be uh, created was appropriately set aside uh, by the motion judge in this case um, in, the interest, uh, in the interest of justice. Refresh my recollection on what those records showed what the t times between I think the three tolls coming down from Freedom New Hampshire that's that's correct your honor uh, there Mr. Martin was initially alerted uh, to a that a charge was charged to his account and the individual who testified at trial uh, indicated uh, that there was uh, some sort of uh, error in the system or the operator at the toll did not override the transponder at that interchange and that's why there was a charge um, uh, associated to it. What the what's the timing of the transponder sort of sequence? On the southbound uh, side from Freedom to Wakefield, and this appears on page 17 of the Commonwealth's brief in a small chart, the Rochester toll booth was 6.40 a.m., Dover 6.51, Hampton 7.04 a.m. 
And the, what would the, the when the car or some vehicle that looked very much like the car showed up in Wakefield, what time was that? Uh, on the northbound from, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the sur surveillance yeah, you vehicle. You've got the tolls coming down. That's you, right. That last one is Hampton, so that's still in New Hampshire. You got that's right. Ways to go to Wakefield. That, that was a, uh, approximately uh, 728 to 735. There that's were, when the surveillance vehicles? That's right. And there was some question about whether the timing on the clocks of the surveillance video was uh, precisely accurate. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chester Roberts was last seen at 7.30, and Mr. Zamiti Sr. arrived at uh, work at 7.45 and made the 911 call uh, okay. um, almost immediately after. Can you, can you um, explain? I know that there was testimony that cash was paid, and, and yet the transponders showed a charge. Is that because somehow they were going through a cash lane as opposed to a, an easy pass only lane or? Not, not exactly. And that was what I was trying to uh, explain initially. It appears that because there was a backup of some traffic in that lane, it was a transponder and cash lane, a dual lane. And it appears that um, cash was exchanged at each of the six tolls. However, at that particular Dover toll, the toll collector did not override the system, uh, which was explainable by the high degree of traffic. And from this, the jury were entitled to infer that an individual with a transponder would not typically stop to pay. Here, whoever was driving the truck did stop to pay, so to the extent that he noticed the transponder was under a misunderstanding that if he paid, he would not be captured. Where was the transponder? I mean, was it, you know, in the dash, uh, you know, in the glove compartment, or, uh, or was it, you know, um, affixed, to the, affixed to the windshield? So that It's you would my see? recollection of the evidence that it was affixed to the windshield, typically how the easy pass is uh, here in, in Massachusetts as well. And uh, when you enter the toll road, do you, uh, does the driver, if he doesn't have a transponder, take a ticket, a paper ticket? Uh, no, it's my understanding that cash is paid at each of those tolls. Then, okay. then ha and you just said that in only one at Dover was there no override, but there was evidence of this occurring all along the way? That's right. So when Mr. Martin received information that there was no override and he was charged for the Dover tolls, he, he was in Florida, which is what While he him. was in Florida, he alerted authorities who then contacted the Department of Transportation for for further information on those records. So they could actually um, trace that cash was paid in addition to, uh, it's, it's, it's remarkable. They, they um, made the connection uh, with, uh, with, an, <coughs> with a, in one of the columns on the toll records with uh, an override action uh, that was put into place by the toll operator. And that would only had happen not occurred at the Dover if, toll. If cash were paid. Correct. Okay. Moving to the double jeopardy question, the uh, judge here properly denied the motion to dismiss based on double jeopardy grounds and then properly denied the required findings motion because there was sufficient evidence under the Lattimore standard to permit the jury to uh, find guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. The most compelling piece of evidence the Commonwealth would suggest is the defendant's DNA on the steering wheel of the truck. And the testimony of the analyst was that he matched the major profile on the steering wheel of the truck and that the probability of another randomly selected individual with that profile was one in 931,000 of the Caucasian population. He also was included as a potential contributor to the minor profile on the keys to that truck, which were kept, the evidence showed, on the inside of the truck. At the second trial, all of the evidence showed that the defendant was never inside the truck. At the first trial, the defendant did testify that he had helped Mr. Martin remove a boat from the water and had been behind the steering wheel, which at the first trial, Mr. Martin refuted. At the second trial, however, there 
The only evidence was that the defendant was never inside that truck. Now, the defendant at the second trial did put on his own expert to challenge the DNA findings. However, the jury were certainly entitled to infer that the only way that Mr. Fitzpatrick was ever behind the wheel of that truck is that he took it on the morning of March 13th and was the one behind the wheel when it made its way from New Hampshire to Wakefield. What, what, what does it mean that the sample was degraded? We normally think of that in terms of exposure to the elements or, you know, sort of ancient, but two weeks? Would, it, would the sample degrade in two weeks in an enclosed environment? Or is that more consistent with something happening months and months ago? Uh, the, the testimony from the analyst was that um, the elements can cause uh, some degradation. She gave uh, information that the ideal environment is a dry, uh, cool environment. Uh, this was a small uh, sample, as defense counsel pointed out. However, defense counsel's own expert said that the size of the sample uh, was uh, sufficient to uh, give a reading. Uh, if you'll note that the uh, statistic of one out of 931,000, that is reflected somewhat in the quantity and uh, the quality of the sample that was given. Was there any explanation for why it would have degraded? I mean, this was um, March. Is, was there evidence about weather conditions or anything else explaining that uh, degraded is, as Justice Cordy suggests, something that you would associate with time? Correct, Your Honor. But I don't believe that the testimony from the analyst was that the sample had actually degraded. I think it was more the size of the initial sample and merely uh, the, the quantity of what was able to be detected at the various loci. But there was, as I recall, no testimony that elements had actually uh, degraded the sample. So I would suggest that there was the powerful DNA uh, evidence as well as the very powerful toll record evidence. So, so, so what was the, how did the, the whole concept of degradation come up? Is, is a possible explanation for the small amount of DNA? Or, or, is, DNA, or is degradation only coming up through, through counsel? Well, turning to that uh, issue, Your Honor, I think the testimony was more in line, and this is specifically with respect to the uh, wire. It's really more um, relevant to the twisted wire coat hanger that inferentially may have been used by the defendant to break into uh, the truck. But again, that piece of evidence seems um, not very consequential when you think of it in terms of the match on the major profile on the steering wheel and uh, the, uh, the keys. In any event, the the testimony of the analyst was that uh, the amounts of uh, DNA and the, her ability to detect alleles at each of the loci was uh, compromised because the quantities were below the threshold level that permit her to make conclusions. And that is reflected in the chart. That that's is, on the wire you're talking about. That, that's on the wire okay. that I'm speaking about, and that is reflected on the chart that is reproduced uh, in the defendant's record appendix, and it goes to this issue with respect to the DNA and whether that single column connected to the wire that went to the jury as an exhibit was admitted in error and invited the jury to speculate as to uh, uh, profile numbers in connection with the DNA. In effect, what the defense is arguing is that the testimony of the analyst that the results on the wire were inconclusive may have been disregarded by the jury, that the jury may have been invited to make uh, other uh, conclusions based on the chart. And I would suggest, Your Honors, that uh, that is not, uh, was not a danger in this case. 
Uh, for one, the chart uh, was admitted with the testimony of the analyst who actually performed uh, the tests on the items here. This is not a situation where we have a substitute uh, analyst. The analyst here was very careful to explain what the significance of the asterisks were in the various columns, and she testified that uh, an asterisk shows that an allele was detected in that column uh, on the electropherogram, but that the quantity was below the levels that she could make a determination about. And on the row connected to the wire, Every single column has an asterisk in there. So the Commonwealth would argue that you truly would be inviting the jury to speculate uh, if they were to make any kind of conclusion about what those numbers meant. And the judge was careful to alert the jury that they may not engage in uh, speculation or guesswork. So especially in connection with the uh, positive results on the steering wheel and the keys, uh, I would suggest that there was no danger of uh, speculation with respect to the wire and would suggest that the substantial likelihood of a miscarriage of justice standard would apply to that analysis. Can, can I ask you to, to uh, address the means evidence that um, the Commonwealth had? It seems to me that that's not um, the strongest evidence. The um, uh, there was uh, no evidence, I don't think, that the homeowner where the, uh, the, the Zamidi's, uh, Zamidi's senior um, knew uh, in advance of the killings that the shotgun was missing from the house. So Th That's correct, and that may be uh, um, connected to the aspect that it was a uh, vacation home, and although family members had been there approximately three re weeks prior, uh, there was a period of weeks where no one had been there. And the defendant, though, the only time that you have him um, even knowing about the, the, the shotgun there was a year before that. Uh, that's right. Uh, and and that the gun was, was never found. And the murder weapon was never found, and uh, inferentially the murder weapon having been the weapon, the shotgun in the neither, Zimity home, neither was ever found. If they're that's different. Correct. Uh, but there was information from several sources, uh, the uh, victim's wife, uh, I believe the victim's mother as well, uh, what, wh with whom the wife was on the telephone, uh, both testified that the defendant was there when the shotguns were found in the upstairs bedroom and there was discussion about where to store them to, uh, in a safer spot uh, in the downstairs closet. But that was a year prior. Uh, that's correct. That was about a year prior. So there is information that the defendant had knowledge uh, of. Assuming the that the guns were in the house that entire time. Uh, that's correct. And I would suggest, Your Honor, that, that although that is not a necessary or inescapable inference, it is certainly a permissible inference, which when taken with the remaining fabric of proof in the case, uh, was the type of inference that the jury were permitted to make. There was also information that the defendant w himself was familiar with guns. Uh, he had a gun of his own. Handgun, though. Th that's correct. It was determined not to have been the murder weapon, and the jury were entitled to infer uh, that he specifically did not use uh, that weapon and elected to use one that was less able to be traced by him. Uh, another compelling piece while we're speaking in the required findings uh, realm is the uh, note that the jury, uh, that the... But that uh, was consciousness of guilt evidence as opposed to um, means evidence. I mean, and, correct. And, and as far as the, the, the shotgun is concerned, um, we don't know when it was um, taken. Um, we know that there was a um, break-in discovered two weeks after the murders. Uh, at that at that house as well as others, um, but there's really not very much that ties the defendant to those break-ins, other than the fact that at one different once the Spears break-in um, that he happened to be the one who noticed that a PlayStation was missing and nobody else did. But but really, I mean, there's no f there's no forensic evidence tying him to any of these break-ins. Is that right? That's correct that there's no forensic evidence tying him to the break-ins, but 
respectfully, I would suggest that there were permissible inferences that tied him to the break-ins. This was an area of seasonal homes. The defendant is one of the few individuals who lives there year round, and the jury were entitled to infer that that put him in a special position to be able to have perpetrated uh, break-ins like these without detection. Again, not a uh, conclusive inference, but a permissible inference. There was also the information, as you uh, pointed out, that he, rather than the own, a homeowner, uh, pointed to missing items in, in one of the homes. That is his very close friend, and one could also think that he would have spent a considerable amount of time there so he would know what the friend had. I, again, absolutely, Your Honor. Not a um, compelled inference, but a uh, permissible inference. Um, uh, on, the, on the conscious, you were, you were getting to consciousness of guilt, and I know what's your strongest evidence on that? Is that the note? I'd say the note that appears on page 182 of the supplemental record appendix, that is a horrible, terrible note, and the jury were certainly entitled to infer that no innocent person would try to derail police on a double murder investigation and send a note like this to a grieving family. And his fingerprints or his handprint, his, his palm print was on it. His that, palm print it? was on it and faced with that compelling evidence, he admitted that he sent the note and that he sent it so that the Zamidi family, according to the defendant, uh, would not think uh, ill of him uh, and try to derail attention uh, f from himself, but he also admitted that he was trying to derail police attention from himself. So with all of this information, the Commonwealth would suggest that there was abundant evidence to sustain these convictions. And if there are no further questions, I would ask that you affirm the case. Thank you, Thank Your you. Honors.